Hello, it's Bruce Williams again, and today I'd like to present the third part of my series on gross pathology of lymph nodes and talk about neoplasia of the nodes. As I do before all of my lectures, I want to thank my colleagues for providing these outstanding images that allow me to make these small lectures available to you. Here is a great representation of lymphoma within a node and extending out into the adjacent tissue around the aorta of this pig. One thing to know about lymphoma is it is simply a tremendous proliferation of lymphoid cells. They don't care about making any type of stroma or inciting any type of matrix to be made. It's just reproduction for them, cell upon cell upon cell. So when we cut through this node, you can see that these cells, unconstrained by any stroma, will bulge on a cut surface and generally are bright white because all you're looking at is cell upon cell. No fibrous connective tissue, no mineral or anything else. The white color is simply a tremendous number of cells that have been added to this tissue. Most lymph nodes that are affected with lymphoma look the same. Sometimes the most important thing is to note the location because the location of affected nodes will become very important for classification and staging of the many types of lymphomas that we'll see in animal species. While we're looking at this great tumor, let's mention lymphoma in pigs is one of their most common tumors. It's usually multicentric, but it rarely affects peripheral nodes, preferring to attack the internal or visceral nodes as we see here. Here's a, here is a vis, very large but infarcted node that you can see that the majority of the node has been infarcted and this is because this tumor has grown so rapidly and it grows without any thought to blood supply. It has grown outside of its blood supply. Neoplastic cells, which are more than two millimeters away from their blood supply, generally end up in ischemic damage. What causes the formation of lymphoma? Let's start with a common cause in a number of animal species, and that is neoplastic transformation of lymphocytes as a result of viral infection. Here we look at the intestine and mesenteric lymph nodes of a cat. And the retrovirus that causes feline lymphoma has traditionally been a major driver in the formation of lymphoma in the cats. Before vaccination for feline leukemia was common in the US and Europe, the number of lymphomas that were caused by feline leukemia was probably over 80% back then. 15% of those cats were concurrently infected with FIV, which didn't cause lymphoma on its own, but which further increased the risk of these FELV infected cats to develop lymphoma. Feline leukemia virus comes in three forms, A, B, and C. Only A is the infectious ones, with B and C being replication deficient, but when there's a co-infection with A, you can see tumors. Most of the thymic lymphomas, which used to be very common before vaccination, were caused by animals that were co-infected by feline leukemia types A and B. The FELV virus contains a viral oncogene which causes tumors when it inserts near the proto-oncogene c mic. Most neoplasms that cause are T-cell lymphomas. However, there is a certain location where if it inserts there, called FEL, FLV1, you'll get a B-cell lymphoma, but overall it's generally T-cell lymphomas. 
Now that we routinely vaccinate for feline leukemia, most of the T-cell lymphomas that we used to see are gone. Another word that you might have heard about when talking about lymphoma arising from feline leukemia is the FOCMA antigen, or the feline oncovirus cell membrane antigen, which was commonly displayed on virally infected cells. Infected cats do not develop a protective immune response against these antigens, but uninfected cats do. Today, we see very few FOCMA positive tumors as a result of feline leukemia infection. Most of the really interesting forms of lymphoma have disappeared today in the U.S. and Europe. And the most common type of lymphoma in cats is now intestinal lymphoma, which is still out there. Early on after vaccination, B cell intestinal lymphomas used to predominate. But now we have gotten much better at identifying lymphoma in the intestine and being able to differentiate inflammatory bowel disease in the cat from lymphoma. So this has given the T cell, especially the epitheliotropic lymphomas in the intestine, a boost. And now they are the most common type of lymphoma in the cat. But if we hearken back to the glory days of lymphoma, when we used to ask each other, hey, I've got a cat under the table, what does it have? And the answer would always be lymphoma. These forms of widespread visceral-based uh, lymphomas were very common, and generalized lymphadenopathy also went along with that. We would see lymphoma in the heart of cats, we would see lymphoma in the skin of cats, in the kidneys, and in the spinal cord, and clinical signs generally reflected what organs were affected the most. I would imagine in many countries who don't vaccinate, these are still seen, making your daily path rounds a lot more interesting. Multicentric lymphomas are usually about 70% positive for feline leukemia virus, and most cases affect the viscera. Another virally caused form of lymphoma is caused by the bovine leukemia virus, an oncogenic delta retrovirus, which slowly transforms like feline leukemia, but unlike feline leukemia, does not work through insertional mutagenesis. Bovine leukemia virus has no known oncogene and does not appear to integrate into preferred sites in the bovine genome. This is an outstanding picture of a super mammary a lymph node from an ox submitted by German Canton. In cattle infected with bovine leukemia virus, we usually see B cell lymphomas, which result from the immortalization of CD5 positive B cells, which produce IgM, and result in a polyclonal expansion of these. Genetically, there are a number of missense mutations at multiple sites within their DNA. And the suppression of p53 is likely a key step in neoplastic transformation. These tumors will also often express polymorphic or other forms of aberrant bovite leukocyte antigens within these B cell tumors. Lymphoma in sheep is also caused by bovine leukemia virus, and 30 to 60 percent of sheep infected with this virus may develop lymphoma. When we look at the appearance of lymphoma caused by bovine leukemia virus, it's usually multicentric and seen in adult cattle. The virus itself may be transmitted by direct contact, or contact, such as natural breeding. It may be transmitted by arthropod bites or commonly 
by vets, including vaccines, but it doesn't persist very long outside the animal. Bovine leukemia virus associated lymphoma, or also known as bovine enzootic lymphoma, often results in a number of asymptomatic carriers. Some may develop persistent lymphocytosis, up to 30%. And then of those animals with persistent lymphocytosis, less than 5% will ultimately develop lymphoma. Because often clinical signs are related to the presence of, of large nodes within an animal, infection may be occult for a length of time until nodes are large enough to cause clinical signs like these large nodes, nodes which resulted in respiratory difficulty for the infected animal. Another very common BLV associated form of lymphoma is juvenile lymphoma in cattle, usually affecting these animals from three to six months of age, but some may even be born with tumors something that sets this apart for the adult onset BLV associated tumors is that at autopsy these young animals often have leukemia with up to a hundred thousand white cells per cc of blood and a concomitant non-responsive normocytic anemia and thrombocytopenia as a result of marrow replacement by neoplastic cells you can see the very large lymph nodes outlined here. Infected animals always, often have kidney, liver, and spleen involvement as well. And here is just a look at those nodes which we saw in this young animal. I don't want to forget to mention goats. Lymphoma is often is also considered the most common neoplasm in goats as well. In goats and sheep, in decreasing order, lymphoma is most often seen in the lymph nodes, the spleen, liver, kidney, intestine, and finally the heart. Let's talk about dogs for a minute. Lymphoma is the most common hematopoietic neoplasm in dogs. It's usually seen in older dogs, of course, and in large breed dogs. Generalized nodal lymphoma is the most common clinical presentation, accounting for about 85%, and diffuse large B-cell lymphomas are most common, followed by peripheral T-cell lymphomas and the often indolent T-zone lymphoma. These are followed by visceral forms, including intestinal lymphoma, cutaneous lymphoma, and finally extranodal forms of lymphoma. And when we talk about indolent lymphomas, indolent lymphomas are lymphomas that tend to affect one node of the dog. They often are far less aggressive, and survival times are longer than we see in animals with generalized nodal involvement. They tend to be a more mature cell type and one of the more common is the T-zone lymphoma, which arises in the area of the node which contains mature T-cells. And animals with this form may live for a year or longer. Great picture by Joel Mills. And here is an animal with generalized nodal involvement. So you can see that all of the nodes are up. This is a more negative prognostic sign in lymphoma in dogs. So once again, location of nodes is extremely important in ultimately diagnosing and staging lymphoma. Lymphoma is also the most common malignancy in the horse. This used to be a pharyngeal lymph node. Essentially, there are five forms of 
lymphoma in the horse in decreasing order, alimentary, multicentric, splenic, abdominal, and subcutaneous. And note that most of these affect, with the exception of subcutaneous, affect the viscera of the horse, and any of them can cause colic and wasting regardless of their form. They're often multicentric and across all of the types of lymphoma that we see. T-cell rich B-cell lymphomas, a variant of the diffuse B-cell lymphomas, is number one. Number one in the alimentary, number one in multicentric, and number one in some subcutaneous lymphomas in the horse. Multicentric lymphoma usually incurs, uh, includes thoracic and abdominal lymph nodes as well as sometimes subcutaneous tumors rather than generalized lymphadenopathy. When you come across these T-cell rich B-cell lymphomas, which are very common, it is incumbent to run immunohistochemistry because they could be mistaken for T-cell lymphomas. The B-cells, which are the actual neoplastic cells which recruit the T-cells, may be few and far between. A species that is near and dear to my heart and a wonderful picture by Lonnie Schumacher shows mesenteric lymph node with lymphoma in a ferret. Now ferrets also get T and B cell lymphomas and they have two distinct types of lymphoma regardless of phenotype. One is juvenile lymphoma in which the animals develop visceral enlargement of the thymus, so large thymic lymphoma, as well as enlargement of the liver and spleen, both very common findings that we see in rodent species. This is classic for juvenile lymphoma in ferrets less than two years of age, come in big spleen, big liver, and a big chest mass, which makes it very difficult for them to breathe. Older animals, on the other hand, develop lymphadenopathy. They may be B cell types or they may be T cell types, and the more we immunophenotype these, the less we actually know besides the fact that young animals get visceral tumors and uh, older animals get lymph node tumors. Eventually we'll sort it out better, but that's a nice classification based on the age of the animal. Mice. It's a mouse with a huge mesenteric lymph node. There is also lymphoma of the spleen as well. I would consider in certain strains of mice histiocytic sarcoma as a differential, but right now we're talking about lymphoma. Lymphoma is the number one killer of many strains of mice, including nude mice. Here's a wild type mouse with markedly enlarged lymph nodes as well as enlargement of the liver and spleen. In previous lectures, I would mention, but it's worth reiterating, that if in a mouse or a rat you see a large liver or spleen, lymphoma is going to be your number one possibility. Mice also carry a transforming virus murine leukemia virus, and the incidence is 100% in mice. No laboratory or wild mouse has been found without the murine leukemia virus provirus within its genome. And many mice have up to 70 copies of this virus within its genome. It may be transmitted both horizontally and vertically. It is responsible for a number of conditions other than leukemia, including demyelination, dilute color in DBA mice, hairlessness, grayness, 
there are a number of murine leukemia viruses, not all of which are oncogenic. Most, if not all, lymphomas in mice arise as a result of retrovirus infections. Most lymphomas are of B-cell or pre-B-cell origin and tend to arise in the spleen. You may hear murine leukemia virus referred to by an older name known as the Maloney murine leukemia virus, named after John Bromley Maloney who worked for his entire career at the National Cancer Institute discovering not only this virus but other tumor viruses including the Rouse sarcoma virus in chickens. Here's a guinea pig. They also have a transforming retrovirus which has not actually been proven to cause disease but type C retrovirus particles have been seen in animals with cavian leukemia, which is actually a leukemic form of lymphoma in which massive numbers of lymphoblasts are present within circulating blood and infiltrate numerous organs. Cell counts in the blood can be as high as 250,000 per cc in this disease, which is usually seen in young adult guinea pigs. Hamsters are very interesting, and in they have a transforming virus, which is not a retrovirus, but a polyomavirus, which is their agent for transmissible lymphoma, which causes epizootics within naive colonies. These tumors do not have detectable virus. And in one classic colony, more than half of the hamsters from 1 to 21 days old, which were exposed to urine, which spreads the virus, developed lymphoma. And in a four-year period, there were almost 4,000 individual cases of lymphoma in young hamsters. Transmission was between animals or ingestion of dried cage litter containing urine and feces. And it was common for more than 25% of newly introduced hamsters in this colony to die of diarrheal disease within five weeks of exposure to hamsters carrying this lymphoma agent. In these animals, most of the lymphomas arose within the mesenteric nodes and the intestine, but also, as seen here, affected the liver as well. But very interestingly, the lymphoma cells in these animals were not per permissive for polyomavirus replication and no virus particles were ever produced. The interesting part of this story is that when adults were introduced and infected, they developed not lymphoma, but trichofolliculomas skin tumors that contained infectious polyomavirus particles. And these tumors are not seen in hamsters that have not been infected with the polyomavirus. A very interesting story that has not been repeated anywhere else in nature. A number of other species also have transforming viruses. Gamma herpes viruses are well known for transforming lymphocytes in non-human primates. Alpha herpes viruses being necrotizing agents, gamma herpes viruses being well known for causing lymphomas. In this baboon, the inguinal lymph nodes are very large because the animal was infected with Herpes virus papio type 1, a gamma herpes virus that causes B cell lymphomas in infected animals. In marmosets and other New World primates, 
herpes virus cimeri type 2, another gamma herpes virus, causes transformation of lymphocytes and ultimately lymphoma. This particular virus is carried by squirrel monkeys who show no cases of lymphoma, but when transferred into other New World monkeys like marmosets, tamarins, and aotus monkeys, will result in widespread multicentric lymphoma. The story of viral transformation is a little different in macaques because most multicentric lymphomas in macaques are the result of concurrent infection by two different viruses. The retrovirus, specifically the lentivirus that causes simian immunodeficiency virus, which will not cause lymphoma unless there is current infection with a lymphocryptovirus, also a type of gamma herpes virus. Uh, in macaques, the gamma herpes viruses have been split into the lymphocryptoviruses and the redenoviruses, with redenoviruses causing a condition known as retroperitoneal fibromatosis, something different. But the lymphocryptovirus, when inoculated into an animal with simian immunodeficiency, will give rise to lymphoma. We have focused primarily on the number one neoplasm of lymph nodes, and that's lymphoma. But let's not forget that lymph nodes, being excellent filters, often will trap neoplastic cells from metastatic tumors. Carcinomas are well known for metastasizing through lymphatic channels, and the lymph nodes will trap them they will enter and set up shop within the peripheral sinuses. And in many cases, neoplastic cells have the unique ability to bypass the antigen discovery portions of the lymph nodes and get down into the medullary sinuses, where they're pretty much left alone as well. Great filters but not great for eradicating tumors. They need to take a lesson from the spleen. There are some inherent changes that you will see in lymph nodes when cancer is nearby. When cancer is disseminated, lymph nodes often undergo the same degenerative atrophic changes that we see in many tissues of the body due to the negative energy balance that cancer provides systemically. If the tumor in the regional draining area of the node is inflammatory, the presence of those inflammatory factors may do the opposite and result in a reactive hyperplasia. And within the medullary sinuses of lymph nodes in close proximity to tumors, you may have an accumulation of histiocytes, known as sinus histiocytosis. However, when the tumor gets down into medullary sinuses, they don't really seem to care that much about it either. This picture by John King shows a classic metastatic tumor to the sublumbar lymph nodes. This tumor generally arises in the epithelium of the apocrine glands of the anal sacs. It's known as a carcinoma of the apocrine gland of the anal sacs. And these particular tumors have such a predilection for metastasis that they will often be well established in the closest nodes, the sublumbar nodes, even before they're detected around the anus of the affected animal. One more metastatic neoplasm and a great picture from Raquel Retch from uh, Texas A&M is that of a horse. And these abdominal lymph nodes have been largely replaced by metastatic melanoma. 
a common neoplasm in older horses. We see it extremely commonly in brown horses and gray horses. Brown horses, small tumors, tend to kill them quickly. And they're very aggressive. Gray horses, like Glipizoners or, or something like that, seem to be able to carry a tremendous burden of these tumors. So when these old gray horses are opened up, the one or two small neoplasms you may see at the tail base don't show anything about the amount of tumors that you might, may see going up either side of the uh, spinal vertebra or are present in many sites within the abdomen. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this uh, a brief discussion of neoplasia and lymph nodes. This will cover the entire group of lectures on the hemolymphatic system. I hope you've enjoyed them and I hope you will tune in again to the Foundation's Facebook page or YouTube channel for more videos. Thanks so much for your attention.